And I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce our speaker. So we are really thrilled to welcome Lisa Henderson here as our presenter this evening as a speaker for Wayne County Public Library. Wayne County Public Library received an American Rescue Plan Humanities Grant from North Carolina Humanities. Funding for this grant was provided by the NEH as part of the American Rescue Plan Act Economic Stabilization Plan. We're really thrilled to have you all here with us tonight. Before Lisa um, begins talking, I'll go ahead and let her get set up. And while she's getting set up, I want to acquaint you with a few of WebEx's attributes that you might not be familiar with. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a little speech bubble that says CC. And if you click on that, you can turn on closed captioning if you need it for the duration of the presentation. And that will be personal to you. And then there's another little speech bubble over in the right hand corner. And you will see where it says open chat and closed chat. And when you click on that, you'll see a little chat box come up that says enter chat message here. When we get started with the presentation, I am going to mute everybody and hold questions until the end, but you can type whatever you like in the chat. All right, everybody, um, if you want to practice with the chat right now, I will turn the presentation over to Lisa. All right, <clears throat> so can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So first, um, I'd like to thank Kelsey Chandler and the Wayne County Public Library for inviting me to speak tonight. I grew up in Wilson, which is, of course, one county over, but my grandmother was born in Wayne County, and my roots are deep in both the Dudley and the Eureka areas, so I'm really glad to be here. My thanks also to each of you who took the time to join us tonight. tonight introduce you to Napoleon Hagen's. No known portraits of Napoleon Hagen's exist, but details of his life can be mined from census records, deeds, newspaper articles, and court records, and even his own testimony before a United States Senate Commission. He reminds us that the lives of African Americans in the late 19th century were complex and varied, that we can look within our own communities to find stories that intrigue and inspire and enlighten us, and that history is not complete without these stories. Here's a, here's a map, topographical map, that was made in 1904. Uh, if you're from Wayne County, and, and I know uh, as old as these, these, this map is, you will recognize uh, what you see. So here, this is 222, going from Fremont and then through Eureka and over to Stansburg. Uh, this is Frank Price Church Road. This, of course, is the, high, the, the uh, railroad track. Um, here is uh, the, the road that goes north from Eureka up toward Turner Swamp. Uh, this would have been the heart of Napoleon Hagen's world. And today, if you were to leave Fremont headed east toward Eureka on 222, about two thirds of the way there, you would see Reedtown Road. That would be about here. Reedtown Road was named for a 19th century free family of color who uh, we have a descendant actually in the uh, on the uh, in the meeting here tonight, uh, and Retown Road will be on your left. If you turn off the highway and drive a short distance on Retown Road, you'll reach an intersection with Napoleon Road. At the right time of year, if you gaze north across the fields to a small white dwelling perched on the edge of Acock Swamp. This is the house that Napoleon Hagens built. Napoleon Hagens was born September 22nd, 1840, north of present-day Eureka, Wayne County. His mother, Lavisa Hagens, was a free woman of color who was either 
married or widowed. His father is unknown. On July 20th, 1845, a Wayne County court approved an indenture apprenticing six-year-old Napoleon to farmer William Thompson. The indenture provided that Napoleon would, main, would remain with Thompson until he was 21 years old and would learn farming skills. Involuntary apprenticeship was a double-edged sword. Though irregularly enforced, state law required the indenture of free children of color who were orphaned or who were born to unmarried women. And apprentices turned out to be a source of cheap workers for white farmers during a time in which enslaved labor was increasingly expensive. However, apprenticeship also guaranteed food, shelter, and instruction to children whose mothers had few ways to earn income. Napoleon and his mother seem to have been able to leverage the system to their advantage. Though working for Thompson, Napoleon apparently continued to live with his family during the period of his indenture. So here we have the 1850 census. That's from the 1850 census. In that census, Napoleon appears twice. Once, he's with his stepfather, Aaron Seabury, his mother, Levisa, his sister, Frances, uh, who was my great-great-grandmother, by the way, and another Seabury relative. A second time, he's listed with his grandmother, Lisey Hagens, in a household William Thompson, who indentured him. This house uh, was probably on Thompson's land. Uh, Thompson, in addition to apprenticing Napoleon, uh, indentured four artist siblings, Minerva, Susan, Nancy, and Alfred, and also Calvin Hagens, who was most likely Napoleon's uncle. Napoleon Higgins would have been released from his indenture right around the outbreak of the Civil War. There is no evidence that he joined the United States Colored Troops. Free few, men, a few free men of color from Wayne County did. They have been forced, like other free men, to work on Confederate fortifications in the southeast part of North Carolina. The five years after the war, though poorly documented, were pivotal in the trajectory of Napoleon's life. He married, his children were born, and he began to accumulate wealth. The first of his four sons was William Coley, who was born in the mid-1860s to Winnie Coley, a formerly enslaved woman. Around 1867, no license has been found, Napoleon married Absola Abbey Ward, born in 1849, a ward, an enslaved woman, and their owner, David G.W. Ward, a wealthy physician who lived just below Stantonsburg in Wilson County and had vast land holdings in Greene County. This is the uh, Ward Plantation House, which still stands just south of uh, Stantonsburg. It's a house that um, I grew up knowing as uh, the home of some of my cousin's relatives, and we would go uh, in the summers, they would have um, family reunions and all their cousins would come down from New York and New Jersey and Washington, D.C. and everywhere. And we would play out uh, on the on the grounds. And when I realized um, 10 years or so ago uh, that I had been in this house, that I, I remembered this house from my childhood, it was really um, it was really a mind blowing moment to connect that house to to uh, Absalom Ward Hagens and to Napoleon. Appy Hagens bore two sons in quick succession, Henry Edward in 1868 and William Scarlet in 1869. A year later, Appy's sister, Mitty Ward, gave birth to Napoleon's last son, Joseph Henry Ward. By his 20s, Napoleon was well on his way to the success he would enjoy for the rest of his life. Around 1865, he had enough spare cash to pay off about $450 of his stepfather Aaron Seabury's debts. That's about, it's a little over $8,000 in uh, today's money. 15 years later, 
when he traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify about conditions for African-American farmers in Wayne County, he was questioned about how he got Napoleon restrained. I rented a farm and started on two government horses. I went to the tightest man I know and got him to help me. I rented from Mr. Mr. Exum out there. Mr. Exum was almost certainly William J. Exum, a wealthy white farmer who lived north of Eureka. Napoleon Hagen's rented land, a tenant farmer, and thereby gained the social and economic benefit of Exum's backing. When the census taker visited the Hagenses in 1870, Napoleon reported that he owned no real estate but a whopping $3,000 in personal property, which would have included household furnishings, farm tools and equipment, livestock, and crops. So this is an excerpt from the 1870 census of the Hunted Township, which is the northeast um, tier of Wayne County. And here you see uh, Poland Hagens, as he was called. Sometimes he was also called Pole. Uh, listed as a farm laborer. In fact, he was a um, what was actually technically a tenant farmer at that time, who owned three thousand dollars in property. His wife, uh, his sons Henry, and uh, this is William Scarlet, whose nickname as a child was Snowby. It's interesting if you look down here at the bottom, you see William Thompson, who was then seventy-three. This is the same William Thompson that apprenticed. Uh, Napoleon as a six year old and um, kept him uh, as a laborer until he was 21. Napoleon, uh, I mean, uh, William Thompson did own property at that time, but his, what's interesting to me is that his personal property was only valued at a third of what his former apprentice owned. On January 1st, 1871, Napoleon bought 221 acres on Acock Swamp, just south of the Wilson County line. The first of at least a dozen or so land transactions totaling hundreds of acres over the next 25 years. He continued to do business with William J. Exum and Mary Exum frequently, including the purchase of a small piece of land in 1878. So this is the, uh, the, the jacket for the deed of William J. Exum and wife to Napoleon Hagen's Three Acres, 1878. Um, the Hagen's family has preserved um, a cache of deeds um, that uh, represent property that Napoleon bought, as well as uh, property that his son, William Scarlett Hagen's bought. Napoleon often did not register uh, his his deeds did not register his per, his land purchases, and when he did, he sometimes registered them years after the actual purchase. So if you notice here, um, this particular deed was received and recorded only in 1885, which would have been seven years after he actually bought this this small parcel. In the years after the Civil War, the Republican Party in North Carolina. Seen as the party of Lincoln and of emancipation, African Americans, uh, men that is, as women were ineligible to vote, overwhelmingly voted Republican and often were elected to local office. Though he never held elected office, Napoleon was prominently active in Wayne County Republican politics and regularly, scheduled, uh, regularly served on juries and as an election judge. So here we have a page from an uh, 1876 Superior Court Minute Book. And uh, this is a list of, um, um, so it says the, the board appointed the following poll holders to serve as judges of election on the Tuesday after the first Monday in November, 1876 in the various townships in the county. And so we have here Nahanta Township and four um, judges of election, of which Napoleon here is uh, the fourth. And as you see, there were other um, other African Americans, uh, Daniel Irwin, 
Harry Sauls, James Sykes. Uh, again, this is a period, even though it's after Reconstruction, it's a period in which African Americans were still uh, quite active in local politics, uh, and this lasted really up until uh, 1896, uh, 1898, rather, um, the, um, when the events that culminated in the Wilmington Massacre effectively ended uh, American in front, uh, voting rights and, uh, and um, participation in uh, electoral politics for the next, say, 50 or 60 years. By the mid-1870s, Napoleon had ascended into Wayne County's African-American elite, recognized by both Blacks and whites as a savvy and successful cotton farmer. He was a self-made man, though he could neither read nor write. His wife, Abby Ward Hagens, born into slavery, picked up the rudiments of an education at some point in her life and was able to scratch out a shaky signature as shown on the deed. So here is, um, this is a deed filed, well, for a property that was sold uh, in 1888. And you, you see here that Napoleon signed uh, with an X, but Abby uh, signed her, her full name. Despite being unlettered, Napoleon Higgins was held up as an exemplar of his community. In an 1880 article in the uh, Goldsboro Messenger about uh, property taxes, Napoleon is one of four Nahunta Township farmers listed. Two, J.W. Acock and Z.P. Z. Uh, Z. Z. Davis were white. The other two, Napoleon Higgins and Washington Reed, were black. Napoleon was the wealthiest of all by an order of magnitude. You see here, Napoleon's uh, total property valued in uh, 1874 was um, $4,155. This is compared to uh, 2,240 for J.W. Waycock, 533 for Z.P. Davis, and uh, 2,327 for Washington Reed. The same year, 1880, Napoleon Higgins was among several dozen men called to Washington, D.C. to testify before a Senate commission about the conditions that had led thousands of black farmers to migrate from the South to the Midwest, uh, primarily Kansas and Indiana. This unexpected wave of migration, the first wide-scale voluntary movement of African Americans in the United States, generated considerable public attention and even alarm throughout the country. Many white Southerners charged that Northern agitators were luring away their black labor for political purposes, while Northerners countered that the white oppression of black Southerners was the cause of this mass migration. And so what happened, this was the, the, um, the migrants were called exodusters. And there were uh, men, uh, Pap Singleton being one of the most famous, who would travel around the countryside um, talking to, uh, to farmers, to black farmers, and extolling the virtues of um, settling in the Midwest, you know, where land was available um, and, um, you know, the, the laws were less oppressive and um, people just had a better had a better opportunity and um, this was of course in, during the booming sort of cotton years in the south and uh, white farmers were particularly alarmed that their uh, laborers were leaving and so um, this commission was formed um, literally dozens of men black and white were called to washington to testify um, Napoleon was questioned primarily by North Carolina's Senator Zebulon Vance. And in response to uh, Vance's questions, Napoleon testified about his wealth and that of other African Americans in Wayne County. This is the, um, the first section of the official record, uh, official transcript of 
uh, his testimony, his name. It took me forever to find this because I was not expecting, I wasn't looking for Higgins, I was looking for Hagens, but uh, here he is. Um, you, you notice that, I mean, these, these documents, these, these um, transcripts are, are really an, um, just a gold mine of information about um, the people who testify, both, uh, you know, black and white. I mean, in particular here, Napoleon reveals, even in just this, sec this first um, section, he talks about where he lives. He says he doesn't stay in Goldsboro. He, he lives 15 miles from town. He owned 485 acres at that time. He worked for it. And, and to the question, were you formerly a slave? He responded, no, sir. I was a free man before the war. Napoleon also spoke of cotton he raised and gave specifics about the pay and rents he made farmers, some of whom were white. He testified that he voted freely and that he served on juries. Napoleon's testimony would have been well received by Southern politicians as he generally painted a positive picture of uh, conditions facing African Americans. And it can be tempting to view him as what we might call today a sellout. However, with careful reading, it is possible to detect an undercurrent of resistance in Napoleon's testimony and a justifiable pride in all he'd been able to accomplish in spite of conditions in the post reconstruction The 1884 World's Fair was held in, held in New Orleans, Louisiana, a port city which handled much of the cotton exported from the American South. The fair was dubbed the World Cotton Centennial because 1784 had marked the earliest surviving record of export of a shipment of cotton from the United States to England. It's not clear how he came to receive this designation, but Napoleon Higgins was named an honorary commissioner to this fair. And it's really difficult to see, but here's his name uh, here. And he is uh, Napoleon Hagen's Esquire, which I think in all of the years that I have researched um, African-American uh, history, politics in this era, I have never seen an African-American man referred to as an uh, in an official document. Around this time, in the eight, sometime in the 1880s, Napoleon built for his family a house that still stands on the edge of Acock Swamp. The house has been remodeled inside and out, but retains much of its form and is the only house built for an African-American family that is featured in Daniel Pizzoni's Glimpses of Wayne, of Wayne County, North Carolina, our architectural history. So this is the Napoleon Higgins house. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier. I um, have been to this house several times. I have never been. Um, every time I have gone, the owners um, are not at home. Uh, and I'm so sorry to say that I have actually trespassed a bit. I walk around and, and, and take pictures. So I hope that... Um, that they will forgive that. Uh, the description of the house in Pizzoni's um, architectural history, uh, there was a description of its, ex of its exterior. Um, apparently there was a section in the back here that was removed and um, basically moved across the road and turned into a tenant house at some point. But it, the description of the interior includes uh, this passage, the most intact room in the house is the West Parlor, as the rest of the interior has been continually remodeled since the 18, since the 1930s. Though the West Parlor's, through the West Parlor's plain four panel door is an elegant small room with plastered walls, a simple Italianate style wooden mantelpiece, paneled wooden window aprons and molded quasi Greek key surrounds at the three windows and one door. This is said to be the room where Napoleon and his wife, Absala Hagens, entertained a family. So whoever is that now lives in the um, in Appy Hagens' house is, is really occupying a 
in place. Napoleon Higgins poured his ambition and wealth into his and Appy's sons, Henry Ford, born in 1868, and William Scarlett, born in 1869. Little is known about their childhood, but, it, but they would have been uh, of increasing comfort as their father's land holdings expanded. Henry and William attended local elementary schools, then left home to enter the preparatory university in Washington, D.C. Henry returned to North Carolina to attend uh, college at Shaw City in Raleigh, graduating in 1890. He received a degree from Howard University's Law Department. After serving as secretaries to the Honorable George H. White, North Carolina's African American representative to the United States Congress, 1897 to 1901, both brothers settled, uh, returned to North Carolina and settled into comfortable, distinguished livelihoods in farming, education, and real estate. So this is Henry Hagen's, um, the young Henry Hagen's. Actually, this is probably a photo when he was at Shaw. He graduated from Shaw in 1890. He took a job for a while at, at while as an attache of who um, had been appointed. He was a, an African American man born in uh, Edgecombe County and he was appointed appointed U.S. Recorder of Deeds. And then Hagen's also um, was secretary to Congressman. He taught for a while in Danville, Virginia, which is where he met his wife, Julia Morton Hagen's. They returned to Goldsboro with the principal of the State Colored Normal School, which was the um, institute that prepared more or less the high school um, with, a, with a little bit and prepared students to become teachers. Uh, for a while, he uh, left the normal school and became a professor at what is now called North Carolina uh, State Agriculture and Technical University, but at that point was called NM University, and was what we might call a gentleman farmer. William, uh, Napoleon and Appy's second son was William Scarlett Higgins. And you see uh, him seated on the steps, um, we believe, of his home on Oak Street, Oak Street and J near James, uh, sort of behind where the synagogue is. Um, this, the, uh, William Higgins had a house there. He, of course, had farmland out in the, in the county. Um, his brother lived on Elm near, I believe, Slocum Street. But uh, so William graduated from Howard uh, Prep, which was essentially high school in 1889, from Howard University in 1993, and then from Howard University's Law Department in 2008. He also taught at the State School in Goldsboro and was a secretary to Congressman White, uh, and as, um, as well as his brother, was the summer. In about 1913, uh, William and his wife, um, Lizzie Burnett Hagens, who was also a Goldsboro native, uh, migrated to uh, Philadelphia, where they raised their uh, their children, and uh, William Hagens engaged in real estate um, sales and management uh, there in Philly. Though. Napoleon's, uh, though Napoleon Higgins' youngest son was denied the advantages afforded Henry and William, he was the most prominent of all his children. Joseph Henry Ward was born August 4, 1870, in Wilson. By 1890, he had struck out on his own, eventually to Indianapolis, Indiana. There, he went to work for a physician who had set him on the path to a medical degree. Joseph Ward founded a hospital, was personal physician to Madam C.J. Walker, and was the first black physician appointed to head a Veterans Administration Hospital, that being the hospital at Tuskegee, Alabama. 
So here is uh, Dr. Joseph H. Ward. In the final years of his relatively short life, Napoleon Higgins continued to raise cotton and to buy and sell farmland in Wayne and Greene counties and city lots in Goldsboro. A letter submitted to a black newspaper in Raleigh during this period spoke of him with admiration. Among our many progressive farmers, I must mention Mr. Napoleon Higgins. In looking over his farm, I find that he is wide awake and keeps up with the times. He advises his tenants to persevere to live economically and within their means, as that is the only sure road to prosperity and wealth. In 1889, Napoleon Higgins drafted one third of his property to his wife, Abby, and two thirds to be split between Smith and William. Abby Ward Higgins died in August 1895 at the age of 46. Almost a year to the day later, 1896, Napoleon Higgins died after a lingering illness. He was only 56 years old. He and his wife were buried in a family plot just west of their home. The plot now stands in a small clearing, a towering marble obelisk marking both Napoleon and Appy's graves. Though local newspapers only noted his death only in passing, Napoleon Hagen's friends made certain that he was memorialized in fitting style. On September 1st, 1896, the Goldsboro Argus printed a flowery eulogy penned by E.E. E. Smith, college president, recent United States ambassador to Liberia, and arguably the most accomplished of Wayne County's 19th century African Americans. Some of you may know, uh, may recognize the name as um, of that of a high school in uh, Fayette. Um, uh, e. e. Smith was uh, intimately involved in the establishment or the rise, if you will, of what is now known as Fayette State University. At 40 minutes after 10 o'clock, on Monday evening, August 24th, 1896, Smith wrote, the white winged messenger that accompanied the spirits of mortals to the realms beyond, quietly over the subject of this sketch and peacefully, gently conveyed across the mystic river of time, all that was mortal of Napoleon Hagen's. Smith painted a glowing portrait of his friend's virtues, his humble beginnings, his hard work and high character, his goodness, his self-built wealth, his determination to give his children what he lacked. If any one of the many noble traits of a useful life stood out more prominently than another, shone more brilliantly than all the other characteristics which he possessed. Oops. Possibly it was his fidelity. Nothing could swerve him from what he perceived to be right, from the performance of duty or the adherence to his obligation or promise was not to be broken. Napoleon's business acumen and successes won relationships across local color lines and among North Carolina's black elite. And when Smith's eulogy called the role of their attendance at Hagen's funeral, Noted Goldsboro's Reverend Clarence Dillard, some of you may a name some of you may recognize as um, the man after whom uh, Goldsboro's longtime African American high school was named. North Carolina rural roads did not have formal names in the 90s when the state required them for a 9 11 a 911 emergency network. 100 years after his death, the name chosen for the road leading to Napoleon Hayes is a permanent memorial to this extraordinary man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this wonderful presentation. Um, 
I'm going to unmute individuals and we can also take questions in chat, but we'd like to open the floor up to questions for anybody who'd like to ask questions of Lisa, chat, everything. I'll also be putting a feedback form link in the chat for everyone as well. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll say that I see that there are two, actually two reads. Um, in the uh, in with us tonight, and uh, the reads were a large uh, free family of color that lived in the uh, Eureka area, just north of um, of Eureka. They um, they're another. I mean, that's another amazing story all of their own. They are descended from two sisters uh, who were married to sisters were born free, married to enslaved men. Uh, had uh, large families, uh, and uh, those families sort of went out and things. And in in Wilson, where I grew up, um, the first African American veterinarian was Elijah L. Reed. He's a member of. Uh, there was a principal of Wilson's Colored Graded School, uh, J. D. Reed, a member of this family. Lots of. Um, uh, carpenters, uh, builders were, uh, it's, great to, uh, it's great to see uh, uh, Emma Reed Bailiff and Demarcus Reed uh, with us tonight. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Because uh, I did a little research on, on the Reeds and, it, and I went back to Rotary, but didn't know that much about it until um, I saw the advertisement for this. and. I went down a rabbit hole of just finding out information. So thanks for putting that out there. Reed was uh Rhoda was a girl. Her sister was Tabitha. Um, um I, you know, there's it's very difficult to research free families of color from Wayne County. Um, you know, we we've got for Napoleon, for example, we have his family in the 1850 census. Um, but prior to that, it's really pretty murky. Uh, it appears that his grandmother is listed in the 1840 census in Nash County. Um, at that time, Wayne County and Nash County actually um, adjoined. There was no Wilson County, so it, it's you know it's not a big stretch to move from Wilson to have moved from Nash to Wayne. Um, but we just we really don't know much about her. And the same thing with Rhoda Reed and, and her sister. Um, we know a little bit, but um, they how they uh, they were both landowners. They left property for their uh, for their children. Um, their children were all prosperous. Uh, who, and I mean, their, these women were born in like the 1790s, you know, and their children were born in the 18 teens and 20s and 30s. Um, and were 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 contemporaries. Actually, a, a little bit older than than he was. We've also got a question in the chat. Lisa, I think we're having a slight bandwidth issue, but we should still be able to hear you. There we go. We have a question in the chat. So can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hello. Um, in the chat, we have a question from Eve Khan. She says, this is absolutely riveting. What are the mysteries about Napoleon Hagens and his family? Are you, what mysteries are you still working on? What's been elusive? It's kind of a yeah. Can you all hear me? I think um, Kelsey. Okay, Kelsey's back. Yeah. So, Eve, I think it's just kind of what I was alluding to with um, with Demarcus. I think the biggest mystery. Well, there are two big mysteries. One of them is um, is his his origins. Really, you know, where where did um, where did the Hagens Haganses come from? The, the Haganses were like the Reeds. 
kind of a large extended family. If you look in the 1850 census of uh, Wayne County, there are several dozen Higginses, but it's not entirely clear what their relationship is to one another. Um, uh, so there, there's that, there's his origins. And then there's also his, um, his start. I mean, he gives this sort of laconic to the question of how we got started. He says, oh, you know, I rented this property from, from, from William Exum. But that doesn't quite seem to, to how he um, went from absolutely nothing to bailing his father-in-law out of a $450 debt in, in, you know, in the same year the Civil War, you know, in 1865. So um, he, by all accounts, there are some bits and pieces that have kind of come down in family lore about him. Um, he was, um, I guess maybe the best way to put it, uh, he was a hard man, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of, um, he was all about his business uh, and did not brook a lot of, um, you know, foolishness from folks that worked for him. Uh, and apparently that served him in good stead. Uh, but still, it's just, um, you know, to make this, this he, he was not, say, for example, unlike the Reeds, you know, he did not inherit money from his parents. He did not inherit property from his parents. Uh, so that, I think that's one of the big mysteries that I'd like to know more about. Hi, I'm on the line. I'm just making sure I'm okay to speak because I hit um, star six. I had to dial in. Is it okay for me to speak? I don't want to speak of over course. anyone. Yeah, of course, okay. please. Yeah, so this is Solel Harris. I was born at first, like, as, you know, on video, but then um, my data was acting really weird. So I just want to um, say thank you to Ms. Henderson for um, presenting this information. I'm totally intrigued because my great-grandmother just listening in and just listening to what I think Kelsey just said is exactly what me and my mom were speaking about. My great, um, my, yeah, my great grandmother, my father's adopted, but his, um, his mother and father's lineage is all he knows. So my great grandmother was a Hagen, spell H-E-G-G-I-N-S. And I remember as a kid going to the family reunions and they had censuses from way back. And um, just as she was saying, they were from Nass County um, and it was a very large family. But, you know, back then, a lot of the name spellings and different stuff and families were split and they went here, they went there um, and they were just, you know, doing their own thing, just exploring. Um, I guess some of being free and some of, you know, just it's, you know, just a big mix up, just like all families. Um, sometimes you just kind of go your own way. But um, then they were, like I said, spellings of Hagen's, like H-A-G-A-N-S, like um, Mr. Napoleon. Um, and then Hagen's, like I said, H-E-G-Z-I-N-S. And like, um, like you all just said, that's Nash County. Um, you know, sure, Wilson County is like right there. Um, Wayne County. And so it's just really interesting um, to hear just a little bit more. I knew nothing about Napoleon Hagen's. Um, I actually went to natural hair school down in Goldsboro um, last year. And that's kind of, that was my first time. I'm from Zebulon, but that was my first time really like traveling those roads. Um, I learned about Dudley, Eureka, all of those um, small towns that I knew, I heard of Fremont and my mom is from um, Bailey, North Carolina. So I knew a little bit about some of those areas, but um, just learning a little bit more, I'm a big 
history girl. So it's been very um, amazing just to hear more. And I'm going to go down, like I heard one of the other participants saying, you know, go down their rabbit hole and just take a moment to um, just do a little bit more research. But this was amazing. Just the information um, that I heard was just like so wowing, like him exploring and taking off just going to like Indianapolis and this um, World Fair. That was so interesting. So thank you for just providing us with this information. And I definitely plan to do more research and I'd like to get a recording if possible. So I'll be reaching out to the library for that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um... You know, it, it is, uh, well, first, let me say uh, thank you to Shauna, just to her comment in the chat. And I thought she would enjoy Shauna, the fact that these were both, uh, that William and Henry were, or Howard University Bison, thought he would like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, these, these stories are, um, they're, They've been forgotten, you know, uh, we, we kind of look around and we, we think of, um, kind of African American history in. In 2, you know, 2 points, there's sort of slavery and then there's the civil rights movement. And we don't really think about, um. Sort of all of the textures of, of, um history, all of the sort of layers, all of the, 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 the really varied lives that, that people led um, that all sort of made up these communities and the histories of these communities, particularly in a place like Wayne County, which had um, a really large, relatively speaking, um, free population of prior to the Civil War. Um, they, uh, those families, who are still in Wayne County. I mean, if you know uh, Artises, if you know Hagenses, if you know Wins, Simmonses, Manuals, Jacobses, Reeds, um, all of those were, were, were free families of color and uh, who had obviously lots in common with enslaved people, but who also just had a really different life. And what of them uh, were able to pass on to their children um, uh, meant that, you know, communities, the sort of social strata in these uh, communities was very, um, was very complex. And, and, you know, so you had people like Napoleon and you had people like the Reeds uh, sort of side by side um, with, um, with descendants of slaves, with with descendants of the you know men and women who enslaved people, or men and women who apprenticed children like um, like Napoleon, and he was a child. Um, just really a complex and fascinating period of time, I think. And um, I I always am interested in just getting more stories told and and having thing of uh, the complexity of of Southern history, the complexity of African American history, um, the complexity of local history. You know, I mean, people seem to think that history happens, you know, up here, and um, really, there's so much that's right around us that's worthy of that can tell us things about why our communities are the way they are now. Uh, maybe can um, can can give us some pointers about how uh, what we might want to change our communities. I, I'm such a big believer in you know Sankofa, um, this idea that in order to move forward, you have to know your past. Uh, I see a quick question: Why do you think Wayne County has such a large number of free people? I, you know, I wrote a whole master's thesis <laughs> on free people of color, and there's not a there's not an easy answer. There's not a sure answer, but um, is that Wayne County had a relatively large Quaker population. And though the Quakers, um, some did own slaves, though they were not supposed to, 
um, they had enough sort of um, social and political influence that Wayne County arguably was a more welcoming place than some of the surrounding counties. I mean, for example, Sampson and Duplin counties, you had petitions uh, being filed in state legislature to remove all the free people and send them to Africa. You know, you had, um, you know, there was kidnapping of free children of color and selling them into slavery. So, you know, people just kind of drifted in. I mean, I kind of look at my family, the Hendersons. Um, we originated in Onslow County, down by Jacksonville. We just kind of slowly drifted up to, to, to the area around Dudley. The same thing with the Aldridges. They were originally from Samson and Duplin, kind of drifted up. There were other families like them um, and, you know, just kind of formed a community. The, the communities around Eureka were comprised of families that had kind of drifted down from Edgecombe County, drifted over from Nash, um, and just sort of formed these communities in which they found similar people. You know, free people of color could not marry uh, white people. They could marry enslaved people, but some there was a there was a cost, there was a price to pay. You know, if you were a free man of color and you married an enslaved, man, you're your children would be enslaved. Um, if you were a free woman of color and you married an enslaved man, your children's father could be f f sold away at any time. So free people of color sought each other's company and and created these these communities. So that's my theory anyway. Are you, are you in touch with Madam C.J. Walker's descendants? Have they been helpful to you? Um, you know, uh, actually, so Joseph Ward's descendants, who are my cousins, um, I am in touch with. And um, I know that they have had conversations with um, Alilia uh, Bundles, uh, Madam C.J. Walker's great granddaughter. Um, and, and I know it particularly kind of, kind of popped up, um, I think two years ago when there was the Netflix, um, yeah, which I think everybody, well, I won't say everybody, it, you know, <laughs> the, and, and, um, the, the Walker family wasn't really crazy about it. And, um, the Ward family, uh, to the extent that Joseph Ward was completely written out of the story, wasn't crazy about it either. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Larry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to come back and talk about the reads at some time. Um, I'd love to do that. And also, I mean, if you, um, I have a, I have a couple of blogs. Uh, let me put them in the chat really quickly. And, um, one of them is dedicated to um, uh, free people of color. Um, and there's lots about Wayne County free people of color there. So that's this first one. And then the second one is my uh, genealogy blog in which I talk a lot about, uh, I give more about the Hagens is more about sort of my lines. Um, and that's that. And then the third is um, a blog, the one that's most active, that's dedicated to um, African American family and history of Wilson County, which is one county over. But inevitably, there's Green County. I mean, there's Wayne County stuff on that blog, and there's quite a bit about the Reeds because so many of them came to um, to Wilson to sort of make their make their names. So that's the three. That's my three blogs. Well, again, I just, I want to thank everybody for, you know, for coming out tonight and, um, and listening. This has been, um, I'm just really passionate about these stories. I hope you can tell and so happy to share 
this information and so I know that there are people who are who are interested as well and um and and want to know more so this is this is great thank you thank you so much lisa for joining us tonight i was um it's been really wonderful to work with you and i have so enjoyed everything i've learned and look forward to learning more great thank you thank you so much <laughs> good night good night do we have any further questions before we log off or yeah i think everybody's Thank y'all have a wonderful night and take care. All right. Bye-bye. Be safe.